Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day. It is indeed another day that you have made, and we rejoice in it. Lord, we continue now our study of the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 16, and we are looking at the bowls of your wrath that you will be pouring, upon, pouring out upon your enemies. Heavenly Father, we pray for each person who is right now in the camp of the enemy and who are classified as your enemy. We pray, O oh Lord, that they would turn and come to you because you are their only hope for everlasting life with you. Lord, we pray that you would touch my tongue to declare this word clearly this morning and touch every heart that hears it. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last week we considered Revelation 15 and I proposed that the sign in the heaven which John saw could be, could possibly be, planet 7X with what we think are its seven moons. Planet 7X or Nibiru or the Destroyer or the Chinese guest star has apparently orbited around the Earth many times through the course of Earth's history. The fact that it might fly by as a messenger of God's judgment before God pours out the seven bowls of his wrath is certainly within the realm of possibility. God always, he always sends judgments before he pours out his wrath. His desire is for people to take seriously the judgments, to take a hint. God's going to take a hint. These are judgments. His desire is for everybody to take the judgments seriously and turn to him through repentance. Should a people do this, then God can, as he did with the people of Nineveh, withhold his wrath. Now this is what, of course, God would prefer to do. But only repentance, a turning away from sin and a turning to God makes this possible. There is no other way. In chapter 15, John also saw many people in heaven beside a sea of glass singing the song of Moses, the servant of God and of the Lamb. Theirs is the song of victory. They had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. And John saw that the tabernacle of the testimony was opened in heaven and coming out of the temple were seven angels, this time real ones. These had seven plagues with them and to them were given seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God. Remember, judgment is bad, wrath is worse. I did mention last week, I've already mentioned today, that believers in Jesus are not appointed unto God's wrath. His judgments can and often do affect believers, but God's wrath is re reserved for his enemies. Now, several weeks ago I was asked where, that, where we, that is Jesus' believers, where we will be when God's wrath is poured out. I do not know. I don't have an answer for that. I am, however, quite certain that those who teach the rapture would say that believers will not even be on earth during the time when God will be pouring out his wrath. Now, I'm not as convinced as they are of this because there are passages in the scripture which lead me to think otherwise. My thought is this, even though I don't know exactly where the saints will be when God's wrath is poured out, I do know that God is more than able to supply the needs of all the saints. Whatever we might need for food, water, shelter, shelter clothing, you know, during this terrible, terrible time that's coming to the earth. I also know that he is able to hide us in such a way that we won't see God's wrath being poured out upon his enemies. He's able to do that. Let's turn now to Revelation 16 and see the wrath God is planning to pour out on his enemies. Verse 1. And I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out into the earth the seven bowls of God's wrath. 
And the first departed and poured out his bowl into the earth. And an evil and grievous sore came upon the men, having the mark of the beast and those worshipping its image. What's interesting about this particular description of this particular bowl of God's wrath is this. The words, an evil and grievous sore, are in the singular. They aren't going to be sores on these people. It will be a sore on these people. On the people who have received the mark of the beast. Those that have been worshipping its image. So it appears... Just one sore on these people. Now that doesn't mean that it won't grow, but it'll start out as one sore. The fact that each of these people will have one and only one sore leads me to suspect that it could be that these sores will originate where the injection site for the mark was. Okay? It just seems that if there's only one sore that it could start there. Like I said, it could spread, but it's going to be only one place, so why not where they got the mark? Okay? The mark was supposed to be such a great big deal, and now they're going to be miserable because of the sore. So if the person received their mark on the right hand, that's where the sore is going to be, if my suspicions are correct. And, and you know, if they got it on the forehead, that's where the sore will break out. Okay? Of course, I can't know this for sure, but according to the Greek here, it will be only one sore. Okay? Wherever it's going to end up being on these people, whether on the hand or on the forehead or anywhere else, these people are going to be miserable because of it. Verse 3. And the second angel, poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood as of one dead, and every living soul that was in the sea died. And the third poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of the waters, and they became blood. The bowls of God's wrath poured out by the second and third angels is pretty gross. Having the sea turned into blood and everything in the sea Dying is going to be bad, but the stench of all those dead things is going to be horrible. And of course, having all those dead sea creatures, that's going to add to the misery of the wicked. But the question, of course, we need to ask is why would God pour out his wrath upon the sea and the rivers and the springs of water? We're given the answer in the text. It's because this is exactly what the wicked deserve. Because of the bloodshed they have shed on the earth. Remember Paul's word, Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. How many times have the righteous cried out to God to avenge the wrongs the wicked commit against them? Lots of times. God's answer has always been, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And he will repay. As in the case of the first bowl of God's wrath being poured out on the earth, here too with the second and third bowls of God's wrath, we're given the reason why. Why this bowl is poured out. Listen to the reason, starting at verse 5. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, Righteous are you, the one being, and having been, a ho O holy one, because you have judged these things, because they have poured out the blood of saints and of prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They are worthy. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. You know, it may look to us at times that the wicked are getting away with murder, even the murder of the saints of God and of his prophets. The numbers, of course, which are rising dramatically in the earth, but not so. Those who shed the blood of the saints and the prophets of God will be given blood to drink. They will indeed reap what they sow. Now, I don't know 
where during this time there's going to be fresh water to drink. And that could be a real problem because, you know, people need water. You know, you can only live about three days without water. So I don't know where the, you know, where people will get water when the second and third bowls of God's wrath are poured out. Uh, and of course the lack of fresh water could bring about the deaths of many of the wicked. Again, I would remind everyone that God is able to provide for everyone who belongs to him through faith in Jesus Christ. He provided, remember, fresh water from a rock in the wilderness, giving water to two million plus people plus all of their livestock. So God is able to, you know, provide whatever his people will need at that particular time. He is our provider, so we can trust in him. Verse 8. And the fourth poured out his bowl upon the sun, and there was given to it to scorch men with fire. And the men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, the one having authority over these plagues, and they did not repent to give him glory. With this fourth bowl of God's wrath being poured out, God's wrath has now been poured out on the land, on the sea, rivers, springs of waters, and now the sun. Nothing is being spared in God's creation from God's wrath. Now, of course, the creation itself did not sin against the Lord. They were subject, subjected to you know, the effects of sin, not because they did it, but because wickedness in man have subjected them to it. But, uh, but now God is using his creation kind of like to fight back. He's using them as agents of his wrath. All right? Um, so, it really is a terrible thing to know what's coming upon the wicked. It's a terrible thing. Which is why we've got to continuously pray for them to come to God through Jesus Christ. He is Lord and he is Savior. As I mentioned last week, nobody has to be in that camp of the wicked. Jesus died for everybody. You know, even at this late hour, well, amazingly, you know, you look at this text, we are in, in, in chapter 16 of the book of Revelation, and even in the last hour when the bowls of God's wrath are being poured out, the Lord gives to John this word, God's desire is still for the wicked to repent. Now, this would not be a call to repentance for those who have received the mark of the beast. Once you get the mark of the beast, there is no repentance. Okay? But apparently there are going to be some people in the wicked camp who have not received the mark of the beast, who could still repent. And that's what God is looking for. But, according to our text, we are told, and they did not repent to give him glory. It's a very, very sad statement. The text also states that the wicked are very much aware of the one who has authority over the plagues. They are very much aware of the God whom they serve, being impotent against the true God who has the authority over all of these plagues. And yet they did not repent. They do not repent to bring glory to the true God. Verse 10. And the fifth poured out his bowl upon the throne of the beast, and its kingdom became darkened, and they were gnawing their tongues for the distress and they blasphemed the God of heaven on account of their distresses and on account of their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. In Revelation 2, in the letter to the church in Pergamum, we heard these words, I know where you live, I know where you dwell, where the throne of Satan is. Whether Pergamum, the location of which is now modern-day Turkey, is still the location of Satan's earthly throne in Revelation 16, I don't know. I do know that Satan, the dragon, gave his throne to the beast in Revelation 13. And that the fifth bowl of God's wrath is going to be poured out upon his throne, the beast's throne. The troubles manifested by this particular bowl of God's wrath is not going to be limited to the beast's throne. 
the troubles are going to extend out to the beast's entire kingdom. And where would the boundary lines of the, that kingdom be? The entire earth. That's what the one world government, new world order is all about. Just creating one giant sized kingdom throughout the earth. So the earth is going to be plunged into darkness when this fifth bowl of God's wrath is poured out. Will this be a physical darkness? I believe it will. It was a physical darkness that God plunged Egypt into at the time of the Exodus. There it was three solid days of darkness. But even though the Egyptians were in darkness, and they said that the darkness could be felt. That's how dark it was. Even though the Egyptians were plunged into darkness, God's people in Goshen had light. So will there be light wherever God's people will be? We just are not told. If the events in Egypt constitute a precedent, then there will be light wherever God's people are. Once again, however, unfortunately, the response to those of the beast kingdom will be that they continue to remain in their obstinance and their wickedness and their rebellion, and they will not repent. They will not turn to the God of heaven. They know who's doing all this, but they will not turn. Verse 12 says, And the sixth poured out his bowl upon the great river Euphrates, and the water was dried up so that the way might be prepared for the kings of the rising of the sun meaning the kings that are going to be coming from the direction of the east. Now, rivers do not typically dry up on their own. They usually dry up because of intense drought. So, apparently, there's going to be such a great drought that the great river Euphrates dries up. And the purpose of the drying up of the Euphrates is going to be so that the armies from the east can cross the Euphrates on dry land as they make their way toward Armageddon in that battle in the great day of the Lord. Now, I haven't exactly gotten to that particular verse, but that's where we're going. Just the wording, the battle of the great day of God Almighty, should tell everyone reading these words that it is not going to be a good day for the forces of darkness. So, why in the world do they even think it possible for them to face off with the Lord and win? You know, why do they even dream of victory over the God of heaven, over the God who created everything, and it is really over all? Well, it's because they have been deceived, and they will continue to be deceived by Satan, the beast, and the false prophet until they are destroyed. John describes the one one's deceiving the masses in verse 13 he says and I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go forth to the kings of the whole inhabited world to gather them together into the battle unto the battle of the great day of God almighty What's interesting here, I think, is one of the many gods of the Egyptians was the goddess Hecate. She was depicted in their artwork and things like that with the head of a frog. Now, the Egyptians considered her the goddess of fertility, water, and renewal. Okay? So she was, they saw her as the goddess of fertility, water, and renewal. And so I'm wondering, could it be that by showing John spirits that have, that are frogs coming out of the mouths of the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon, I am wondering if what these particular, you know, unclean spirits are, are deceiving the people in the thinking that their god... Hecate, possibly. Since she is the god of fertility, water, and renewal, she is going to be the one to bring fertility back to the earth since it's going to be destroyed and refresh the water since it's going to be turned to blood and bring renewal. I'm just wondering if maybe 
that's the deception. That it is going to be the God of heaven and earth to do this, but it's going to be this God, this frog God, who they think is the God of fertility, water, and renewal. Well, we know that without a doubt they're wrong. <laughs> I mean, just think of the, what happened in Egypt. The Egyptian sorcerers could do only so much. And finally, they admitted to the pharaoh, uh, this is the finger of God. <laughs> and they were even standing back going, we don't need to touch this, you know. So, in verse 15, we hear the words of our Lord. He says, behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one watching and keeping his garments so that they should not walk naked and they might see his shame. Listen, our Lord is still calling to his own to watch and be prepared by keeping their garments ready nearby at hand so that they would not be caught naked when he comes. He reminds those who will watch and keep his garments ready that they will be blessed. This word of blessing is the word that I believe is going to his saints, which is why I believe the saints are still on the earth. Then in verse 16, we notice the one who is actually orchestrating the gathering of the kings of the earth together at Armageddon. The frog demons aren't doing it. Okay? It's the Lord who is doing it. Verse 16, And he, the Lord, gathered them unto the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. And once, once everyone and everything is in place, the seventh angel will pour out his bowl of God's wrath. And that's where we're going to start next week. Amen.